Don't sleep, sing this part. That is the vision. And it goes on.
John the Baptist declares, one more powerful than I is coming. To unite us in kingdom life, the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out. Hallelujah.
The Lord be with you. Good morning. Welcome to Corpus Christi First United Methodist Church, where our mission is to help people experience Christ and his infinite love available to all. And you are part of that all to whom God says, I love you and you are my beloved precious child and beautiful to behold. We're going to talk more about this in the sermon and in our reaffirmation of baptism later in the service because today is the day on the Christian calendar each year when we remember the baptism of our Lord and we have the invitation to remember and reaffirm our baptism this day. So welcome. Um, if you are here for the first time, I especially hope that you've found yourself warmly welcomed and invite you um, to find other ways to connect with the church beyond Sunday morning. I'm Pamela Dykehouse, the senior pastor here, and I'd like to know who you are. Um, so whether you're here the first time or all the time, you can locate one of these slips in the pew pocket, fill it out on paper, or scan the QR code to let us know of your presence in worship. Um, and if you're with us online, you can go to the church website um, to uh, let us know of your presence with us in that format today. These are placed in the offering plate later in service if you are here in the room. On the back of your worship program, you'll find news and information about the church's ministries beyond Sunday morning. We have a lot of different opportunities for growing as a disciple of Jesus, and I hope that you will find some way to connect beyond this hour of worship on a regular basis. I want to highlight a few of these things um, for us this morning. There is a men's Bible study that just began, had their first gathering last Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. here in the church dining room. Um, men of all ages, we welcome you to come and do that. Um, you can bring your own breakfast if you haven't eaten yet before you get here, and coffee is provided. They're currently in the book of James, um, led by Pastor Marshall and um, another young man in our congregation, Chris Wartram, who just joined the church today, in fact, in our 9 o'clock service, so um, you can get to know him. We have two opportunities coming up the last weekend of this month. So on the 27th of this month, on Saturday, we're going to have an UNO tournament for all ages. Um, and that'll be a lot of fun and fellowship. And so anybody can participate, come and play UNO, even if you've never played before. Super simple game. Um, and it is fun whether you are young or old. I understand a four-year-old won the tournament last year who had never played before in his life. So. You can do this. You can do this. And then the following day, on Sunday the 28th in the afternoon, right after this worship service, we will have a quick lunch, and then we will be doing, once again, Rise Against Hunger, which is an opportunity to do hands-on mission work, bagging dry uh, packaged meals so that they can be shipped around the world to folks who are in need in places where there are food shortages, um, places of natural disasters and human-made disasters that cause people to be uh, limited in their access to nutritious food. You get to be a part of that. We're going to bag 20,000 meals or some crazy number like that. It is for all age levels and ability levels. So please plan to be a part of that. Great day to bring a friend with you. Um, invite somebody to join us that day for worship and for that activity afterward. As we are gathering for worship, we want our children to feel welcome and included in the service. And so after we have a moment of passing signs of Christ's peace to each other, the children will be here at the front with Miss Cherie for a special moment just for them. So everyone, let's stand, offer signs of welcome and peace, meet somebody new today, and children come on up front to meet Miss Cherie. have one for you. have one for yes. <laughs> I 
I got it. I'm going to invite everyone to find their seats. Scarlett, you don't have to come up. You don't have to come up. We all stand tall enough that we can sit here over the pole. I'm going to invite everybody to have a seat. Sometimes, not everybody comes up front, and that's okay. We don't ask you guys to sit up front every time you have to hear a message, and it's okay when all kids don't come up front. And so, I have been reflecting on Pastor Pamela's message that you're going to get to hear today. And we're talking about baptism. And think about how many babies have been baptized here in this sanctuary. Maybe you or maybe one of your babies was baptized here in the sanctuary. I actually, my very first Sunday here, Candace's son, Coda, was baptized here in the sanctuary. And I think about the dreams that we have for each one of those babies that have been baptized here. And God has a dream for us. And, and I'm going to read you a book today. So you all get to have children's story time. I'm going to read you a book today. And this book is by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And as you hear in Pastor Pamela's story, you're going to hear some messages about South Africa. You're going to hear some about uh, Martin Luther King. And of course, you're going to hear about the Bible and God and Jesus. And I think this ties it all together. This is entitled God's Dream. Dear child of God, what do you dream about in your loveliest dreams? Do you dream about flying high or rainbows reaching across the sky? Do you dream about being free to do what your heart desires or being treated like a full person no matter how young or old you might be? Do you know what God dreams about? If you close your eyes and look into your heart, I'm sure, dear child, that you will find out. God dreams about people sharing. God dreams about people caring. God dreams that we reach out and hold one another's hands and play one another's games and laugh with one another's hearts. But God does not force us to be friends or to love one another. Dear child of God, it does happen that we get angry and hurt one another and soon we start to feel sad or so very alone. And sometimes we cry, and God cries with us. But when we say we're sorry and we forgive one another, we wipe away our tears and God's tears too. Each of us carries a piece of God's heart within us. And when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. God dreams that every one of us will see that we are all brothers and sisters. Yes, even you and me, even if we have different mommies and daddies, or we live in different faraway lands. Even if we speak different languages, or we have different ways of talking to God, even if we have different eyes or different skin, even if you are taller and I am smaller, even if your nose is little and mine is large, dear child of God, do you know how to make God's dream come true? It is really quite easy. It's as easy as sharing and loving and caring. It's as easy as holding and playing and laughing. As easy as knowing we are family because we are all God's children, one in baptism. Will you help God's dream come true? Let me tell you a secret. God smiles like a rainbow when you do. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the Lord. This is from Mark 1, 9 through 15. 
In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And he was coming up out of the water. He saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from the heavens. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days. Tempted tested by Satan, and there with the wild beast, the angel waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came from Galilee proclaiming the good news of God, saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news, the word of, the, the word of God for the people of God. I'm grateful for Scarlett reading the scripture this morning. It reminds me that on one of my earliest Sundays here, her big sister did that, and she was small seven years ago. In the early 1990s, which were the late years in the struggle to in end the institutionalized racial segregation called apartheid in South Africa, an American volunteer was teaching in Motse Maria High School in the Liboa homeland in the northern part of South Africa. That volunteer teacher introduced her class of 14-year-olds to the life of Martin Luther King Jr. They had never heard of him, understandably so, an ocean away and a generation apart. Well, some days later, after they had learned who he was and what he had done, they had absorbed his story, the teacher gave them a copy of his final speech, I See the Promised Land. It was titled. And the students with manuscript in front of them listened to an audio recording that the teacher played of him presenting that. The students listened as if hypnotized. Some moved their lips along with King as they followed the words on the page. And when he came to a line that surely you have heard from this speech, I've been to the mountaintop, he proclaimed. One student leaped from her chair and began to dance around the room, inspired by his words. And at that time, another student exclaimed in her lilting Sotho accent, oh, Martin, your words moved from my ears to my heart and into my soul. Friends, these were children whose entire lives and the lives of their parents and their grandparents had only known institutionalized, sanctified, codified racial segregation. And they heard those powerful words of hope. The young teacher who presented that to them was the right person at the right place, in the right time, to introduce MLK to those children. A quarter century after his assassination, King's prophetic voice proclaimed that truth that spoke to people some 8,000 miles across the ocean. He was the right person, in the right place, at the right time in 1990-something Liboa. As I was beginning my 2023 sabbatical journey, I spent last Martin Luther King Jr. day in Oklahoma City. On that Monday morning a year ago, I choked down the stories of the 1995 bombing of the Murrah Federal Building in that city. 
And then in the afternoon, I found solace to recover from that morning in the museum. I found solace by joining the throngs of people that lined that city's downtown streets for the parade. The MLK Day parade in that city, as in many cities across this land, was joyous. There was singing and, and bands and drums and, and speeches and inspired words. And I could see King's legacy alive in the leaders and the citizens there. And again, King was the right person in the right place at the right time. And tomorrow, nearby, in our community, neighbors will join in the 38th annual commemorative march from the courthouse to Mount Zion Baptist Church. And again, right person, right place, right time. And I don't know if you can read it from where you are. It's pretty tiny on the screen there. But on the purple float, those are photographs that I took in downtown Oklahoma City last year. On that purple float is a placard that says, you can kill the dreamer, but you can't kill the dream. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream lives on. The civil rights movement was a political and social undertaking, but in listening to King's preaching, and I spent a lot of time with his sermons in the past week, a Christian could hear that he declared a dream, a vision, a prophecy of the kingdom of God. In his most recollected speech, he described his dream of an America in which the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will sit at table together. You remember that line? You've heard that speech? He did not speak of some abstract racial harmony. He painted a picture, a vivid picture, of the shared table that stands for God's justice, God's way, God's reign in this world, the kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven, looks like white kids and brown kids and black kids who were all friends sitting at the table together in the school cafeteria. And in our present time, our era of seemingly ever-increasing political animosity and divisiveness in this country, when anti-Semitism again has been stoked by the Israel-Hamas war and racial rhetoric is far too often tolerated, just overlooked, King's voice is still the right person, right place, right time. And don't you know he would wish that it wouldn't have to be? I wish it wouldn't have to be. For generations, Israel had waited for the right person in the right place at the right time. And for generations, it had seemed so far away and the people had thought that this person or that one was the Messiah and been disappointed, but he wasn't. And they had wondered if it would be in this time or the next that the Messiah would come. Oh, what these words of Mark's gospel must have stirred in the first hearers. If you've got your Bible or your Bible app handy, open it up. Mark chapter 1. Verse 15, and we'll work our way back to the beginning of the reading that we did. Verse 15 says, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near, or is at hand. At long last. This is what all Israel had been waiting for. It was not a new piece of good advice for how to live better. It wasn't a new type of spirituality. Here's how you should practice religion. It wasn't a new political agenda. It was something more than all of that. It was the good news that the living God was on the move 
was doing something, was doing a new thing, had come now to bring forth his kingdom, to inaugurate it, to make it real, to put it into action through Jesus. Take a look at Mark 1, beginning at verse 9. It is the story of the right person in the right place at the right time. We pick up the story with Jesus coming from Nazareth to the Jordan River to be baptized by his cousin John. And when Jesus comes up from the waters of baptism, he sees the heavens open up and the spirit descends upon him like a dove and a voice from heaven says to him, you are my son, the beloved, and with you I am well pleased. We make our faith more complicated than it needs to be. And there is certainly more to it. We've got the entirety of this book and 2,000 years of Christian history and tradition. But that message that the voice of God speaks to Jesus in that moment of his baptism coming up out of the water suffices as the summary. If you can't remember anything else, or if you don't know what to say to somebody else about what this faith is, here's the sentence. The summary of the gospel. Friends, when God, the maker of heaven and earth, looks at you, he says to you what he said to Jesus on that day. You are my beloved child. I'm delighted with you. In your baptism, God said that to you, and every day since. Try it on. I've got the words on the screen for you. I know I tweaked them a little bit from the NRSV translation that we read. But let's try these words on. So here's how it's going to go. So everybody's going to do it at once. So you don't have to be embarrassed or worried. We're all going to talk over each other. So I'm going to say my name. I'm going to say, Pamela, you are my beloved child. I'm delighted with you. I'm going to be speaking those words, the voice of God speaking to me. And you're going to do that by filling your name in the blank. You got it? We're going to do that all together. Ready, set, go. Pamela, you are my beloved child. I'm delighted with you. God is delighted with you. You are God's beloved child. And God says that to you and to the civil rights leaders and the masses of people in that movement in the 1950s and 60s and in the 1990s to 14-year-olds in a high school in Leboa and to their teacher who crossed an ocean and in the 2000-somethings to parade watchers in Oklahoma City and those who will march tomorrow in our city. And it's going to take the whole story of Jesus' life and death and resurrection to make known to humankind, to us, how it is that he's the right person, right place, right time. The one who comes to fulfill the messianic hopes and liberate God's people. But this is the good news. The kingdom has come in Jesus. God's own son has broken through the veil between heaven and earth to declare a different reality. A new way of being. For those who are baptized in Christ... That kingdom is within us. It is within you. You are a bearer of this good news in your very being. And our life is a journey of learning to live by this different reality. Even when we can't fully see it with our eyes. I'll speak for myself, but I'll generalize. For most of us, most of the time, the heavens are not open. <laughs> For most of us, most of the time, we don't hear the audible voice of God speaking directly to us. And so we walk by faith and not by sight. 
We live as though the kingdom dream is the way it already is. We let the gospel change us and make us the people God knows and says that we are, new people, God's beloved children. You are the right person in the right place at the right time. We are the right people in the right place at the right time. If you're following along with me in Mark chapter 1, you see what happens next. What happens? He comes up out of the water and he hears those beautiful, wonderful words, sees that vision, and the one who is freshly washed in the water and so lovingly named and claimed by the Spirit and the voice of God is pressed out into the wilderness for temptation. Wow. That's what comes next. So in the United Methodist Church, um, we are Wesleyan. The, the founder, the forefather of the Methodist movement that started in the 1700s is a guy named John Wesley. And John Wesley has notes on the Bible. He has some, just some short notes, verse by verse, through the Bible. They're free, available online. So if you want to know what John Wesley thought about a particular verse, you can Google that and find it for free. Well, on this chapter 1, verse 12 of Mark, he makes this note. In all the children of God, extraordinary manifestations of his favor are wont to be followed by extraordinary temptations. You got it? You go to the mountaintop, and then you find yourself in the valley. Certainly been true in my own experience. And also, what Mark is doing here is aligning Jesus' story with the great drama of Israel, of their exodus from Egypt, a journey filled with temptations in the wilderness over 40 years, not 40 days, before they arrived in the Promised Land. And so it is for many of us, and all of us together, too. Before we get to live on the mountaintop, we got to trudge through valleys. Martin Luther King Jr. surely clung to his baptismal identity before he was this leader on the national and world stage. He was a Baptist preacher's son and a preacher himself. And he knew who he was in Christ. He knew his true identity as a beloved child of God, and he had to know how he was loved and how he belonged to God in order to face the harsh wilderness in which he did his ministry, his life, not for 40 days, but for the entirety of, of his days. Jesus dwelt with the wild beasts, Mark tells us and was tested by Satan. And in the trenches of that battle, Jesus may have wondered, during that time of temptation, was he the right person, the right place, the right time? And so by God's grace, he was tended by the angels to assure him that God, his Father, was watching over him, had not abandoned him, was loving him and acting through him and continually pouring out the Spirit upon him. I have no idea what your wilderness is or has been. I'm sure it readily comes to mind for you. But I would describe a wilderness for many as whatever tries to keep you from believing and living in the truth about God and about yourself and about the kingdom. The wilderness is what tells you that you're not the right person and you're not in the right place and it's not the right time. But friends, let us be clear. It is the evil one not the living God. 
who says, not you, not here, not now, not enough, not possible, that is not God. After Jesus makes it through the wilderness time, his wilderness, the story continues with the arrest of John the Baptist. It's just kind of quickly passed over. It's one little detail and the story moves on. But pause for a moment there. The arrest of John the Baptist. John goes to prison. If you know the rest of that story from the other gospel's testimony, you know that ultimately he is beheaded. John, Jesus' cousin. John, who a month ago we were talking about how his mama Elizabeth was pregnant with him when Jesus' mother Mary was pregnant with him and how when Elizabeth heard Mary's voice, John leaped in his mother's womb. John and Jesus were bonded before birth. And then John is the one who laid his hands upon Jesus and, and, and it helped him to go through, as a witness to us, the washing in the water for forgiveness of sin that Jesus did not bear in himself. It is this John who has now been locked up in prison only to go to his death. And it is on the heels of that news That's the way it is in the world, that Jesus knows it's time to act. The kingdom movement was to go forward. It was time for Jesus to go public with God's dream. It was time for all to be called to the good news, to be invited to repent. Now I want to talk about the word repentance a little bit. You've probably heard me say before some other preacher, it's about turning away from our sin, and it is that. But I believe that in our 20th and 21st century Western American, Western Christianity, we have made the understanding of repent too narrow. It is that. Turn away from your sin, that which separates you and God. Yes. And turn away. Repent from the social and political and even religious agendas that are contrary to God's kingdom ways. Turn toward the one true God and be loyal only to him. Repent and turn away from all that would impede your believing the good news that you are God's beloved child. And that is enough. Repent and turn away from anything that drives you into the wilderness of doubting who and whose you are. Repent and turn away from whatever would mislead you from believing that as God's children, we are the right people in the right place at the right time. You are the right person in the right place at the right time. For living into God's dream and bringing forth the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated in God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift through offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism. Acknowledge what God is doing for us and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. Before I move into 
the formal liturgy for the reaffirmation of baptism, I want to give an explanatory word. There may be those among us today in person or worshiping with us online who have not been baptized. And so I want you to know that I welcome you to participate in the liturgy and in the action of coming in a bit and touching the water and to receive it as an invitation uh, to consider baptism. It is not a baptism, only a reaffirmation for those already baptized, but for those unbaptized, receive this invitation that you are welcomed by God. Pastor Marshall or I would love to visit with you at a later time to talk more about what baptism is um, and possibly to prepare you for Christian baptism at a later date. So be welcome uh, to participate fully today if you like. To the whole congregation, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord, in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? I invite everyone to stand and join together in, the, in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. feel like sitting down again? Please do. I've done this twice already in our other services this morning and there was no organ in those other locations so that's my excuse anyway. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth, tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his worst works to the nations, his glory among all people. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit and by this gift of water call to our remembrance the grace declared to us in our baptism. For you have washed away our sins and you clothe us with righteousness throughout our lives, that dying and rising with Christ we may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. So at this time, all who wish to participate are invited to come and to touch the water as a remembrance of your baptism or an invitation to baptism. You can do this in different ways. You can put your fingers into the water and just simply have it on your hands. You can make the sign of the cross if you want on your own forehead. If you're in worship with a friend, a family member, and want to do that for one another, I welcome you to do that. It's not a rebaptism, but a reaffirmation. Um, we as pastors will not do that, um, not offer it to you so that we might not construe it or misconstrue it as a baptism today. But come and touch the water and be thankful for God's gift of grace and God's naming and claiming of you as his beloved child with whom he is well pleased. After you touch the water, I welcome you to kneel for prayer if you would like. Come as you feel led down the center aisle and return by the side aisles for this today.
So today, a little bit after everyone clears out, um, a few of us will be gathering in the parlor, and by a few of us I mean uh, I've got a couple of teenagers uh, between the ages of 12 to 14 that are going to come together and talk about faith. We are doing confirmation this season, and the season stretches from now, starting today, all the way to Confirmation Sunday, which will be April 7th. And so while the train starts today, it is not too late to jump on the train. So if you have a grandchild or you know of somebody that hasn't gotten the opportunity to take confirmation, uh, around the ages of 12 to 14, they are more than welcome to join us on this journey where we take the faith that was passed on to us from our parents and we take a closer look at it and ask the right questions, uh, the questions that we need to ask, uh, the brave questions, and we start to make that faith into our own. And that's what we will be doing through the confirmation season, which will happen from 1230 to 2 after Sunday service. Uh, if you have any questions, come grab me after the service, and, and I will talk to you about that. Uh, but the sheer fact that there is a platform and an ability for young people to be able to help think about their faith, to question their faith, and, and to really grow in this way is an amazing ministry to our young people, amen? Thank you for being the kind of church that makes these ministries possible.
always, our hope is that you have heard a word from the Lord as we have gathered for worship today. It may have been in a song, a prayer, the scripture reading, the sermon, a quiet moment. But I invite you to listen and to discern your response to God's call upon your life because he has claimed and named you, beloved, precious child. He is pleased with who you are. And so how will you respond to that grace and that love? What are the next steps for you in your faith? If you have heard something that you want to work through, talk through, pray through with one of your pastors, let Marshall or me know. We'd be glad to find a time apart from Sunday morning to visit with you and to pray with you and to, to, to help you sort it out. Those next steps might include Christian baptism, if not already baptized, might include uniting in membership with the church, or just figuring out how to live into God's call on your life in some new way. We're about to start uh, next Sunday a series called Dream Like Jesus. Been talking about it to you for a while, leading into the Christmas season, and we're going to begin from now through the Lenten season all the way up to Holy Week, looking at the parables of Jesus. And with him imagining what it would look like if indeed we all lived in the kingdom way that is already within us through his grace. So I invite you to think about what there might be one thing, thinking about the sermon and the scripture and this entering into dreaming, what might be one thing, one step, one concrete action in your life within this year ahead where you make space at the table for somebody who may have been told or otherwise perceived that they were not welcome at the table, whether it's the table of the Lord in this room or the school cafeteria or some other metaphorical table in our community, in our world. Think of one concrete step that you can take this year to welcome someone to the table who has not felt welcomed. And if you're scratching your head about what does the preacher even mean by that, well then ask me and we'll talk about it. And I'd love to hear what some of those ways are as the year goes on. Let's join our voices in singing a familiar tune, possibly new text to you, a beautiful hymn that brings together all that we have celebrated and learned and as we feasted on God's word today.
If you wish to have Holy Communion today, it is available to anyone who would like to receive it. No prerequisite, all are welcome. It's available in our prayer chapel through the doors at the front of the sanctuary to the right. Um, there will be someone there to offer that to you. It's also a place for quiet prayer or to have someone pray with you if you would like. May you go from this place knowing yourself to be a beautiful, beloved child of God who is called, who is claimed, and who is the right person in the right place at the right time. Go with the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit upon you now and always. Amen.